Well, thank you all for coming to this today's Authors and Women's at Google event. We're pleased to have Professor Catherine Brady with us today. Professor Brady, who teaches in the writing program at the University of San Francisco, is the author of two collections of short stories, The End of the Class War and Curled in the Bed of Love, for which she received the 2002 Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction. She also told me she has another book coming out. She'll tell you about that. She's here today to talk her, about her biography about Elizabeth Blackburn, Blackburn and the story of telomeres, deciphering the ends of DNA. Please welcome Catherine. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. And I wanted to thank Anne and Pepe Yu and women at Google and authors at Google for inviting me. So I'm going to figure out where to put papers here. And I wanted to, I guess I would start by saying, um, I have some notes here. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, I um, wanted to say a few words about why I came to write this book and then really kind of try to tell you the story a little bit of Elizabeth Blackburn's story. Um, and I am a fiction writer, as Anne may have mentioned to you. I primarily write short stories. So how come I wrote this book about molecular biology? Um, Dim-wittedness could be one possible reason, because I decided I could just teach myself molecular biology, which well, was a bit iffy. And, but also, I had always found that when I would read science books, I think biology is really, really beautiful, and I could never understand them. By page 37, equations and technical terms would come in, and I would be lost. I could no longer uh, follow what I was reading. So I wanted to write a book for me and someone like me who thought, this is really cool, but could not, uh, did not have enough of a previous background to understand what was going on. And the other reason that I chose to write this book was that I, I am a fiction writer, and one of the things that interests us primarily as fiction writers is character. And Elizabeth Blackburn is a really fascinating character in so many ways. She's a very gentle, modest person to the point of being self-effacing. So if you met her, you would never guess that she's one of the leading researchers in the world. She's won virtually every major national and international scientific prize, and her name is frequently mentioned for the Nobel. So how did she not only survive but flourish in this very competitive field? And so those were some questions about character that were interesting to me. How did she negotiate the competitiveness of this field, especially when she's somebody who kind of dodges competition? And she began her career in the 70s when very few women uh, were working in this field. Um, what kind of competitiveness the dimness did she have if she's so shy and retiring, then how did she do this? Um, and then it turns out that the field that she founded, telomere research, is basically the only field in molecular biology where women actually have true parity. What's different about this field than another field um, that makes that possible? What did she and her colleagues do to make that possible? And finally, I was interested in how she thought about her work. Science as work to me is a very interesting proposition. I was delighted to visit the lab and watch what they did and see what machines they used. But also, we tend to read a chemistry textbook or a biology textbook, and there's information in it. But how science actually happens is sometimes thrilling, sometimes really dreary, boring, repetitive, mechanical work. And oftentimes, it's about how someone solves problem. And and what kind of resources and ingenuity they bring to that. So that was really interesting to me, too. And I was also interested in the ways in which her career as a scientist, in a way, much against her will, began to intersect with national scientific policy. So I'll probably say a few things about that as well. Um, Elizabeth Blackburn was born in Tasmania in 1948, and she was one of seven children. And when she was still in high school, probably around the age when her peers were tacking up posters of Peter, Paul, and Mary, she was tracing diagrams of amino acid structure and putting them up on her wall because she thought they were so beautiful. Um, she attended the University of Melbourne, uh, where she got a, an undergraduate degree and a master's degree. And she was very aware, even that young, 
that she had adopted something that she calls protective coloration. She didn't want to stand out as a female in this largely male world. She didn't want her gender to be noticed. And she also needed to shut out the possibility of discrimination because it was so threatening. So she put the blinders on, tried to blend into the background, and felt like if she did that, she would be able to succeed in this field. Um, when she left that uh, university. She was accepted to the Molecular uh, Research Laboratory at Cambridge. No, it's known as the MRC. It's very famous. It's where Francis Crick and James Watson discovered the double helix. Um, she got into a PhD program there in a very prestigious lab with the help of her advisor at the University of Melbourne, Frank Hurd. And he wrote a letter later saying that, you know, I thought Lilith Lid ha has a, had a wonderful scientific mind, but you know, I don't think she had a strong enough ego to succeed. In other words, she was too nice. And there was this disjunction between this very soft, very meek exterior and what is actually a very fierce and very tenacious intellect. And as you can probably imagine, that intersects with gender in some ways, but it also just happens to be an interesting contradiction in her personality. And she arrived at Cambridge in 1971 to work in the lab of Fred Sanger, who was a two-time Nobel Prize winner. And she was working in his lab at that time. They were trying to sequence DNA. And these were the first efforts to sequence DNA. And it was actually sequenced by members of that lab while Liz was still there. And this was done on very simple bacteria. And I don't know how much to digress, but to me it's sort of fascinating they didn't have the technology. We sort of take for granted certain things, like, yeah, the gene, the sequence of that gene. But in fact, the process is sort of mind-numbingly um, dreary, laborious. You get this very tiny amount of a very tiny substance. You treat it um, with electron, electric ions, electrify it to make the DNA separate out. And then you look at a little tiny x-ray that's like a blur for ra looking for radioactive labels to show up, or in today, it's fluorescent. And you're supposed to look at that and figure out what's happening in the cell. So it's very difficult. Trying to sequence DNA at that time was tantamount to uh, filling in a crossword puzzle in a foreign language where you could guess only one letter at a time and where it was located in a given word. And then you had to try to figure out where the other letters would go. But you didn't know the language. So, you know, if you had a three-letter word and you found the T, you wouldn't automatically think T-A-G, the. You didn't know what came next. So luckily, the alphabet of DNA involves only four bases in various arrangements. Everybody's familiar with that, C, G, A, and T. Yeah. Um, when she was there, this, the, the laboratory, the world of Cambridge at that time in the bi molecular biology was very exciting. Um, Francis Crick and James was still there, and he would hang out in the cafeteria. He actually interfered in the design of the cafeteria because he wanted to make sure that people could have conversations, scientific conversations there. So in one sense, there was this intellectual democracy where people really, uh, anyone could talk to anyone if they could hold their own in a debate. And Liz remarks of herself at that time that she listened and learned. She didn't, she, she didn't speak up that much. A few years before she had been to Cambridge, another woman researcher, Joan Stites, arrived with a postdoctoral fellowship. She and her husband were both researchers. Her husband was shown to a lab, and Francis Crick turned to her and said, oh, we don't have a lab for you. Why don't you just do theoretical work in the library while you're here? So this was an atmosphere in which there were still very few women. There was a lot of discrimination. And Liz was keeping quiet and listening. But she recalls herself as very unassuming. Some of her peers at the lab had, have said, well, you know, Liz was so nice, but if you asked her to be critical, she was very, very critical. So she was still adopting this method of lying, in a sense, lying low, hoping her gender would not be noticed. She also was carefully, and this was a lifelong practice in a way, trying to sort of work off in the corner where there wasn't a crowd. A lot of the researchers in Fred Sanger's lab were working on very similar methods to sequence DNA and competing to be the first ones. She found a method nobody else was trying and worked off in her little corner. She doesn't like competing in a crowd. 
And again, I think this is a character trait that could be mistaken for timidity. And a better analogy in her case, I think, would be of a racehorse that doesn't like to run in the pack, but would rather run out front. So she found her own little place and kind of dodged all this competition. Uh, when she left that lab, she had plans to do postdoctoral research here at UCSF. And she, while she was there, she became engaged to a fellow researcher, John Cedat, who got a very prestigious fellowship at Yale. So she just decided she would drop her fellowship and follow him to Yale, where she had no position and no funding. So he said, why don't you try the lab of Joe Gall? And Joe Gall is a cell biologist. And she kind of showed up in Joe Gall's lab one day too embarrassed to say, well, I'm here because my fiance is here. And he thought she was being presumptuous. Like, she thinks just because she comes from Fred Sanger's lab, she can walk in here and get a job. So they kind of got off to a bad start. But that bad start was very quickly overcome because Liz had this, at the time, very rare skill. She could sequence DNA. And Joe Gall had just managed to do something uh, very interesting that would intersect with that. He had managed to figure out how to isolate the genetic material in a very simple organism, tetrahymena. They're little tiny pond dwellers. They're protozoa. So he had figured out how to separate this genetic material, and he didn't have anybody who knew what to do with it when he did that. And again, it was actually really hard to get this accomplished. So he was like, well, maybe we can make something work out. So he set her to work sequencing the chromosomes in tetrahymena, and very specifically, the end region of the chromosome. So here's a little tiny organism, but the question that she was exploring was not tiny. Uh, when the double helix was identified and scientists began to figure out how it worked, they had run into a big, big question mark that they couldn't figure out. There are little enzymes called DNA polymerases that copy the DNA strand during cell division. And the way that they hook on to do their job involves having a couple of extra bases to kind of hook onto. When they get to the end of the strand, because there are no more bases, they fall off. So this would mean that every time a cell divided, there would be a little bit less DNA in the chromosome the next time around. Uh, you're all sitting here, sitting upright and blinking, so obviously something must be happening that, so to preserve all that DNA, right? There'd be no life on Earth. But nobody could figure out how this worked. So she was looking at these end regions of the chromosomes called telomeres to say, well, what is it? I'm going to sequence it and see if I can figure something out about what it is, where it comes from, how come it keeps, you know, it doesn't get worn away. So she actually was able to find out some really interesting things. Um, she found a, a repeat sequence at the end of every chromosome. It would like be a repetition of those bases, C, G, A, T, over and over and over. Just six of them repeated constantly in the same order. This is, if you think of DNA or a gene as a sentence that's a command that tells us what to do, here's a, a lot of gibberish, a nonsense. Uh, nonsense syllables at the end of the sentence. What is it doing there? It's not a gene. Um, she also discovered that from one chromosome to the next, some of them were longer, maybe several hundred repeats. Some of them might be 20. Some of them might be 40. If DNA was just being copied during cell division, how come one was longer and another was shorter? She didn't know. She knew she found something really exciting that flew in the face of accepted scientific dogma. And her idea was, hey, great. I'll keep working on this. So when she left uh, Yale, once again, her work was almost derailed. She and her then, by now husband, John Sadat, were looking for jobs in the same geographic region, which made it doubly hard. And she was sort of terrified by the politics of interviewing for jobs. She didn't get a job. He got a job at UCSF. And once again, she just followed him. And she was so traumatized by looking for work that at one point, when she thought she might be pregnant, she thought, oh, good, I can bow out. I won't have to deal with this anymore. About a year after they came to San Francisco, she did land a job of her own at Berkeley in a lab of her own, where she continued trying to figure out what was going on with these funky little end regions on the chromosomes. So she started to hypothesize and find evidence that something in the cell was adding 
this repeat sequence from scratch. Again, according to molecular bi biologists, this is not possible. It doesn't work this way. You must be mistaken, lady. And she just decided, well, I'm gonna look for evidence. And once again, a little bit like the accident of her arriving in Joe Gall's lab, just when he had been able to separate the genetic material that she would have needed to work with, she happened to meet somebody at a scientific conference named Jack Sostek. And he was a yeast geneticist. And they began to talk, and they fooled around and came up with an idea for something that Liz calls a cockamamie experiment. They were going to take telomeres from tetrahymena and insert them in yeast, an entirely different species, and see what happened. This had never been done. They had to invent an entirely new technology for recombinant genetics, which you don't need to know about to make it happen. And of course, they didn't know why would a, a telomere from one species survive in the cell of another species. So it wasn't very likely to work. They tried it out, fooled around, and they found when they extracted these telomere fragments back out of the cells that not only had they remained intact, they hadn't been destroyed, which suggested that that repeat sequence had some protective properties. They had been added to and there was a new repeat sequence that wasn't the same as the one on the original strand. What was that about? It was a clue that there was an enzyme and that for each species, that repeat sequence might differ. And eventually this was found out to be the case. So Liz believed that this was the real clue she needed to, to be able to start working on proving the existence of this enzyme. Her collaborator, Jack Sostek, at first did not believe that was the reason. There were all kinds of other reasons that would fit very nicely with existing scientific wisdom that were a lot easier to accept than this outlandish theory that she had. And she also chose to compete with him head to head to be the first to identify this enzyme. So the shy, timid, retiring person uh, went right up against this senior colleague and was like, I'm gonna get it first. And she, for 10 years, was working to find this evidence and often kind of, I don't wanna say ridiculed, but challenged very fiercely at scientific conferences when she presented her work. And she was like, don't you worry, I will prove. I will prove this. And of course, uh, she did. And part of it was her predilection for working in an uncrowded field or striking up for new territory is actually part of her originality. She goes off and finds something really odd and quirky that other people aren't paying attention to. And in this case, it turned out to be something pretty important. And it was another lucky accident for her that she had been working with Jack Sostek. But I came to feel in writing this book that um, exceptional scientists have a fortunate and receptive relationship with chance. They know when it's the right time to take a gamble. So with her graduate student, Carol Greider, Liz demonstrated um, that this enzyme, which they named telomerase, was actually in the cell, just adding on to the chromosome, and it could do it at any time, not just during cell division. And Something that's really fascinating about this enzyme, most enzymes are made of proteins. Some also have a component that's RNA. This one had an RNA component, unlike any other enzyme. It had a little template inside. It had all the right bases. And when it hooked on to the DNA strand, it had the template that added the bases to the DNA. It contained its own template for adding that repeat sequence. And this was, again, not acceptable according to dogma, not possible, and yet she proved it. Here it was, this enzyme did this. And what the discovery of both the uh, sequence and the enzyme demonstrated was that this is how our chromosomes are protected. This little nonsense syllable at the end, uh, which can be re repaired and added to so that the, chrom the cell can keep dividing for longer, um, is what sustains the integrity of the genetic material. And um, it's like the cap on a shoelace. It's how our genetic information doesn't just get frayed off and disappear in the, the liquid solution of the cell. So when they first published these findings, of course, many scientists shrugged them off. They were still working with tetrahymena. That was a quirky little creature. It probably wouldn't turn out to be true, but it did turn out to be true. And Blackburn continued working with trying to identify the sequence of this. It, it was like 150 bases long, this little piece of RNA in the enzyme. The template's only about, differing in different species, about eight to nine bases, but she was trying to figure out, okay, there's this whole long strand of RNA. 
it, the other parts of it must do something too. So in her lab, they would just fool around. Let's change one base and see what happens. And they would do this in very simple organisms and sometimes very little would happen and sometimes disaster. The cell immediately goes <coughs> and dies. So they were playing around, seeing what would happen and finding out a lot of important things. And they also began looking at the proteins that collect around the telomere. It has very special proteins. The whole chromosome usually has uh, proteins that attach to it. They're helping to do the work of the cell and to protect the chromosome, but different, entirely different proteins reside on the telomere. And what they've actually found is that these little teeny proteins are like a swarm of gnats constantly fluctuating around the telomere. And when their composition changes, some go away, some come. That's what allows the enzyme to get onto the telomere. So the cell actually regulates when the enzyme comes and goes, and also when other proteins might come and go. And I wanna say, for me, okay, you're thinking by now, okay, what does this have to do with me? This is this very tiny, tiny little part of the chromosome. It turns out to have this huge, complicated system of proteins rotating and orbiting around it this incredibly intricate mechanism. The tinier you go, the more intricately worked the system is. Scientists still haven't gotten all the way to the end of the intricacies of this system, and it's what's called a homeostatic system, so that all these interrelated factors are involved in its success, which means that if one factor doesn't work out, there's a backup very often. Pretty important since, after all, this is how come there's life on Earth. So, there's this intricacy that you wouldn't even expect at this tinier and tinier and tinier level. It's like a series of Russian, those nesting dolls. You, go, you, get, you think, now I understand it. You have to go tinier and tinier. Um, and I wanted to say a little bit about, uh, at this time, Liz had really accommodated to the norms of lab rat culture. Work, work, work. She continued to kind of basically try to disguise and deny the fact that she was a female. And she had really accommodated to this norm but she got pregnant very late in life. She had put it off because she didn't feel she could afford it in her career. Earlier, she had been told by a physician, you better quit your job and get pregnant now, you're gonna run out of time. And she assumed as he did that this was an either or proposition. But she did have her son, Ben, and was on bed rest during that preg pregnancy and managed to run her lab from bed like a good little workaholic and felt embarrassed that she had had to ask for time off for pregnancy. And she published one of her most significant papers and made a lot of these discoveries by the time her baby was two. And she also decided to leave Berkeley because there were turf wars over new building space. And she didn't feel she could handle that kind of aggressiveness in terms of protecting the space for her lab. And if she left and moved to San Francisco, she could be closer to her child. And to me, it's very ironic that she could afford to do this, something that for most women is a professional kiss of death because she was so successful in her work that she was gonna find another really good place to go to. Um, by the time that she arrived at UCSF, the field that she had launched had really taken off. And I want to just kind of explain to you now why we've been talking about this little pond dweller all this time. Um, telomeres and telomerase had been found in virtually every living creature. And the telomerase replenishes the telomere in many organisms pretty constantly, as in yeast. But in humans, it doesn't do that. In most of our cells, there may be only trace amounts of telomerase, except in like our immune system cells and other specialized cells. So it, the um, human health and aging is actually influenced by the health and well-being of our telomeres. When people get older, their immune systems don't work so well. And one of the reasons is that telomerase is not replenishing the telomeres in, and the telomeres are getting shorter in those immune system cells. So they stop dividing and we need, when we get sick, we need them to divide very rapidly and uh, profluently or we're not gonna get well. So it was also discovered um, in about nine, over 90% of human cancer tumors Telomerase, there's an overabundance of telomerase. It's as if the cell goes crazy and there's this huge amount. So it turns out that telomerase plays a role in cancer and cancer metastasis. So Liz's work on this little protozoan 30 years ago has led to really important research on aging, on human health, and on cancer. And it illustrates that 
uh, how unpredictable scientific progress really is. You could have seen this as this odd little um, place that she'd wandered off to, and it turns out that although it didn't suggest an immediate payoff, it has enormous implications for human uh, welfare. Um, I'm just trying to think about whether to, I'll, I'll look at my watch and that will help me decide. I think I'll skip over some of the science details, but I did want to focus for a few minutes on Liz as a role model. I think she's a role model for women in the fields of science, technology, and engineering. She's a role model for scientists, and she's a role model for all of us as citizens. And I'll try to say a few words about why and then leave time for questions. She... Um, founded a field of research in which women have flourished. And at conferences in similar fields, maybe a handful or fewer of the presenters are women. In telomere conferences, half or more of the presenters are women. In fact, one conference organizer sort of gleefully told me that she has to always worry about making sure that men are fairly represented at telomere conferences. Um, Today, an identical number of men and women get a PhD in the life sciences, but only 15 to 20% of tenured academic research positions are held by women. Women seem to drop out uh, somewhere between doing postdoctoral work and getting those tenure track jobs where they're actually running a lab of their own and pursuing their own experiments. And it seems that a lot of the barriers of discrimination have been removed, yet women are still, you know, statistically they're less productive than, than male researchers, they garner fewer federal grants, and they're more likely to leave the professor, profession. And there was a recent study done by the Center for Work-Life Policy that basically said, essentially, engineers have a hard head culture, scientists have a lab coat culture, it's also called lab rat culture, um, computer experts have a geek culture, and what they all have in common is that these environments are unsupportive, if not downright hostile to women. That was the conclusion of the study. Um, and women who per have perceived that, that to succeed, they have to act like men, just as Liz did. And her thinking changed after she had a child. She began to challenge some of these ideas, and she also began to speak out um, about discrimination. And up until then, she had been afraid to rock the boat. Um, so I think culture, the issue of the culture of these workplaces really makes a difference for women. And it will, women have to depart from their gender norm to fit in, to be sort of uh, openly aggressive and competing or whatever. And many women, that for them it's uncomfortable, but guess what, catch 22, if they do succeed in learning to act like that, behavior that would be admired in a man is considered negative in a woman. So it's like you can't win. And the, another difficulty that women face is that whether they perceive, where they perceive bias or discrimination, men do not. And this has been repeatedly demonstrated, but as an example, at UCSF, they did a study and the women faculty um, differed sharply from men in their view of the university as a good workplace. About 60% of the women, nearly about, said they experienced discrimination. One in 10 men reported experiencing discrimination and the women felt there was a glass ceiling on their advancement, but the men said, there's no glass ceiling here for women. So how do you complain or advocate for change if your coworkers don't see even, they can't even see that there's a problem. So that has really influenced what's happened to women in these fields. And one of the interesting things too is this, this is another sort of, uh, how is this gonna work out logically? It's, one of the key reasons for women's success in any of these fields has been mentors. Women who can mentor them, but also help them understand how this male culture actually works. So what that means is that if you have more women in science, you'll have more women. But first you have to get more women to have more women. So you see the problem, right? That issue of mentoring. And of course women still face the bias that they are not as good at science and math as men are. You may or may not recall that big speech by Harvard President Lawrence Summers in which the president of Harvard explained that women aren't as good at math and science and that's why they're not as successful. And the other reason that they're not as successful in sciences and math and engineering is that they choose not to commit to a demanding career. Which brings me to another obstacle to women's advancement, which is that statistically, they devote more of their time to their families and children, and thus they feel very burdened in careers that require them to be 24-7. Your average startup company, your average lab, where if you run an experiment, it will not necessarily be finished by, you know, 
five o'clock so you can pick up the kids from daycare. If it lasts longer, you have to stay longer. It's very hard to accommodate the life of a family around that. And I would say too that one of the problems with this is again how it is experienced. An American Chemical Society survey asked men and women uh, about their careers and many more women chemists than men reported that balancing family and professional life was their greatest career obstacle. 21 com percent compared to 2.8 percent. So if women are doing the lion's share of the family work, they also experience more distress about the conflict between family and work. And this is why many of them tend to leave these fast track positions, which means that we as a society are robbed of their contributions. So if the workplace cannot accommodate this experience of family life, not just the needs of families, but how it's experienced by women, it's very hard for them to be successful. Um, when I was describing Liz's career, I kind of made a point of mentioning the moments where she almost dropped out, she almost gave up. I think it's really important to hear these stories, to know that it's possible to succeed, and that it's also possible to succeed without adopting an, a quote unquote alpha male model. A lot of men in this room probably don't regard themselves as alpha males. I don't think anyone, I don't think it's just a gender issue. Liz is a nice person. She plays fair, she is generous, to the people who work in her lab. She has consistently given equal credit to her graduate student, Carol Greider, for their co-discovery, despite the fact that she was obviously the much senior partner. Um, she uh, believes in the open sharing of scientific information and has worked to make that possible on the web. She doesn't uh, have the attitude that you hoard what you know so your competitors won't get a leg up on you. She believes science depends on the open sharing of information. This gives another role model for people in her field. And I think it's one of the great reasons that women have been so successful in that field. You don't have to become a killer, let's say, in order to succeed. And it's, one of the things that I think is very interesting is that People who I interviewed who talked about Liz would often say she has no ego. She has no ego. She lets people practically push her around in the halls at UCSF, and she's one of the most preeminent people in the building. And I would say Liz, of course, like anyone else who's healthy, she does have an ego. She had the ego to persist in her work and to have the confidence that it was good. But she has a tendency to separate her ego from the work itself. I don't know how to quite explain this. She's so pure spirited about what she does. She's not invested in, I'm going to be right, my idea is going to be right, I'm going to get there first. If an experiment goes wrong, her attitude tends to be, oh, that's how it works. And she once said to me that, you know, biology is constantly about theorizing a model for how a system works. And in a way, it always will be because we're just, we're looking at everything at this level, molecular level. You're looking at everything at a third remove. You're theorizing a model. Well, if you get really attached to your model and your idea and how it works, you're unable to look at new evidence in a very objective light. And she says it's really important to be able to not invest in one way of seeing the world. And it's really a gift. And for her, as she, the way that she puts this is, you have to think it's fun. It's not just about be flexible-minded. You actually have to think it's, think it's fun when your entire theory of how something works goes completely and you have to start over. That's a good time in Liz's mind. And I think it's one of the reasons why she's such an original and exceptional scientist. And it's helped her to train other people to be exceptional, too. I would like to take about two or three minutes to say why else I think Liz is a role model for all of us and then take questions. Um, Liz has always been somebody who avoided the limelight and her attitude was the work speaks for itself, keep your personality out of the picture. She has served in a number of capacities um, in scientific organizations because scientists began to realize They've always had a, a culture that eschewed politics, but they began to realize that if they didn't invest in politics, the funding, which most of them depend on through the NIH, wasn't going to be forthcoming. They needed to advocate uh, to society why their work deserved funding. So Liz um, had been active in those ways and in terms of open access to, to scientific information. And shortly after 9-11, she got a call from Leon Cass, who had been asked to chair the President's Council on Bioethics. And Bush had established this council not long after he declared a policy of 
um, not funding with federal f money any studies on human embryonic stem cells because this was considered immoral research. So he created this council. Cass calls up Liz and says, will you be on it? And she said that she felt that she, like she should do it. It was a time when everyone in the country wanted to do something. And she also felt it would be important to have a scientist on this council as a means of trying to ensure that its uh, debates on scientific matters were objective and informed. And what happened when she got onto the council was that very frequently its, its, its conversations were very biased against science. Uh, the language of reports and council documents was biased, and there were misrepresentations of scientific fact. Um, because of uh, an, a kind of uh, impulse to counter the possibility of doing embryonic stem cell research, for example, uh, the chair organized presentations by people who declared that adult stem cell research worked and you didn't need embryonic stem cell research. The problem is that every leading adult stem cell researcher would have firmly contradicted him. So she began to be very particular and about saying, this is not correct, this is not correct. I cannot sign off on this council report or that council report because it's not correct or it's biased. For example, um, in one council report, embryos were referred throughout as a child to be. And Liz said, we're going to use the scientific term embryo or I won't sign off on this report. And she um, is so quiet and sweet and retiring that I think that Leon Cass thought, well, if I push her, she's just going to tip right over. And he did push her. He basically bullied her for these objections. And she said, well, I won't back down. She couldn't. Part of her ethics are that you, and the ethics of any good scientist, you don't mess with the facts. And part of the Bush administration's science policy is that you do. As um, James Margerberger, a White House spokesman, once explained after the White House was caught doctoring a report on global warming, um, this administration tries to be consistent in its message. And sometimes that requires you know, a tune-up of the language. So when Liz was seeing similar kinds of tune-ups in the language in these reports, she objected and she wouldn't back down. Well, she got fired from the council. And the chairman, Leanne Cass, stated as his reason that they were entering a new area of science. Their discussions were going to focus on neuroscience from now on. And it was a different area of expertise, which I guess he thought would have been over Liz's head. So he brought on to the council three new members, and none of whom was a scientist, but all of whom uh, had advocated right-wing policies. So you can kind of see what happened there. And Liz, who so much dodges publicity, was getting a lot of attention from the press for a period of a few months. And she made up her mind that she would give interviews whenever asked, because she felt that it was so important that the issue of the role of scientists in government was being debated publicly, that she could not afford not to do it. Many good scientists have become increasingly reluctant to serve on government scientific advisory panels for fear that, that it will damage their credibility if the results are not scientifically accurate and reliable and sound. So I found, as I wrote this book, that really I was writing a hero story, writing the story of someone very meek and modest who managed any way to become really successful, writing the story of someone who practices and teaches in her lab a scientific ethics without needing to um, shred people in order to help them succeed, and someone who spoke out on national policy in ways that benefit us all. Um, thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Was there any particular thing about that area of biology that attracted so many women, or was it just because uh, Liz was in that area? What happened was it was founded by women, Liz and Carol Greider. Other women began working in the field. So in the very early days, there were, a lot, there were mostly women in this field. Because it was the hot field at the time, I think, was, uh, was chromosomes, but not the end region. So they could, if they didn't like all the um, aggressive competition, they could go over here and not have to deal with that and still get good work done. So that may have been a factor for a number of them. It was a good, there was an opening 
And a lot of women who were just getting their PhDs at the time went into this field. And I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of stereotype threat. When someone is in a minority, gender or ethnically, it, they tend to perform less well when their, um, their numbers are very few. But there's a certain point where, at which they reach critical mass and they're no longer intimidated, let's say, by the opposite sex, and they perform really, really well. So what happened was when this field was in, was in its babyhood, women had critical mass. It was a girls club. Uh, at scientific conferences, when Carol Greider gave talks, Liz Blackburn was out in the hallway walking with her baby. Uh, imagine Francis Crick offering to do that for a younger colleague. So there was this critical mass which m made the field very feel very friendly and open to women. And they had women mentors now. And since, as I said earlier, women mentors tend to increase the success of women, they increasingly began attracting women to this field too. Thank you for coming.